Welcome to the Humans and Earth podcast. We bring you inspiration and practical resources for healing our planet and ourselves. It's time for soulful contributions that regenerate life on Earth. I'm Shara Arman, a thought leader and teacher who believes we're ready to renew Earth and heal ourselves in the process. You can find our work online at humansandearth.com and on Instagram at School Humans Earth. I'd love for you to be on our newsletter list and receive our updates on Instagram. Please share our work at the School for Humans and Earth with anyone you think might be interested and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to this podcast so that we can include more and more people in the regeneration revolution that I believe is happening on planet Earth. Welcome to today's episode. Welcome back to Humans and Earth. It is a true delight to me to be interviewing today Karen Laurie of KarenLaurieCoaching.com. Karen helps people release unconscious blocks so they can have priceless results as they watch all their dreams come true. She is the best-selling author of three books that I personally have found very supportive and influential. Chronic Pleasure, Use the Law of Attraction to Transmute Fatigue and Pain into Vibrant Energy is one of her books. Her second is Effortless Enchantment, a memoir of magic, magnetism, and miracles. And her third is Chronic Pleasure in Relationships. Karen's work has been endorsed by Deepak Chopra, Dr. Bruce Lipton, Gay Hendricks, Dr. John Jacquish, and many more. She studied psychobiology, how the mind affects the body in college, and she's had a lifelong interest in epigenetics, neuroscience, health, and spirituality. She has studied the science of mind, has been meditating consistently since 1991, and has studied the law of attraction for over a decade. Karen is also an actress who has done over a thousand hours of TV, films, and commercials. As an actress, she observed how when she played different characters, her body would shift physiologically in response to each character she embodied, which is of course, psychobiology in action. Karen went through some intense emotional and physical challenges that doctors and psychiatrists and psychologists could not seem to help her heal. This is detailed in her book, Chronic Pleasure. In fact, she got sicker the more treatment she sought. This caused Karen to seek answers, which led her to dis discover ways to transform her fatigue and pain into vibrant energy and chronic pleasure. It led her to release unconscious blocks so that she lives a life of magnetism and miracles and helps others do the same. You can find her work at KarenLaurieCoaching.com. That's K-A-R-E-N-L-O-R-R-E coaching.com. Welcome, Karen. So happy to talk with you. Thank you so much. That's an old um, <laughs> bio because I've been doing this for 14 years. I think that was the bio on the back of my or on my Amazon book, perhaps. Okay. This is the one that, that's on Karen Laurie coaching right now, but um, oh, feel I free better to add anything to it that you want to. <laughs> No, I better update it. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> you have, uh, you, you've advanced. So as you and I have talked about, this podcast focuses on not only the human earth relationship and how we can choose in this century to create regeneration for people and planet, but it also focuses on how the well-being and transformation experienced by individuals contributes to well-being and transformation 
for the whole, all of us here on Mama Gaia. So as I've told you, I consider your work a perfect fit with what I bring to this podcast audience. One of my many interests, as we talked about, is helping people to see that individual well-being and thriving are just not only mirroring, but completely interlinked with what's going on for humanity as a whole and for the earth. So as you and I talked about a little bit before we started recording, there's so much conversation in the last few decades, and this pattern is really persisting on problems, bad news, dark predictions, things that are going wrong with the earth, things that are going wrong in human society. But I am really interested in bringing forward approaches that emphasize we are creative beings. And if we want to transform what we're experiencing on planet earth, we can. So I'd love to hear your version of that because um, this is an area of expertise for you. Thank you so much. Yes. And thanks for everybody who's listening. I appreciate you guys so much. So um, for me, that makes total sense that you have that desire because as Einstein said, the problem, and I'm going to misquote it, I'm sure, but the problem cannot be solved with the same mind that created the problem. And that understanding that the problems on one energy level or one frequency, and then the solution is on a totally different level. So the more we talk about the problem, the bigger the problem seems and the bigger the problem gets, which then often doesn't happen to me anymore, but it often depresses people. I mean, I remember when I used to be sick and not have the clarity that I have now and the love that I have now, I, I listened to some news on NPR, which is was supposed to be, you know, like not all not all bad news. <laughs> and I pulled over my car and I thought, oh, my God, I should die. You know, this is just I don't want to be in this world. And um, and I just was like, this is not something I want. And then I had this awakening. And now um, I, I just focus on the solutions. I don't have a I don't focus on what the problem is for more than a, you know, a second or so, because I can get a good understanding of what the problem was, but then what is the solution? So for example, a, a guy I know, he's my, he burns off little sun damage on my skin, my dermatologist. I interviewed him on my show. I have a show called Stories We Love. And on that show, I'm interviewing people who are doing good for the world because I kept seeing all this negative response. I don't watch the news myself, but I was on the news in Australia and I saw they wanted me to talk about, you know, how do you handle the pandemic? The whole normal news show is about this many people dying and this many people this. Uh, and when I talked, it was an eight minute talk. And yet I got so much positive response. Thank you for saying something positive. Thank you for being a light. You know, that was really amazing. It really helped me. I realized I've been focusing in a negative way. You know, it was just so sweet that people really could feel it. Um, and and then after that, I talked to the news person who had invited me on the Australian news and said, I bet you guys could do a positive news show. Well, his thing wasn't quite ready for it yet, but then I just started doing it. And um, so what I was gonna say about my dermatologist, um, he really cares about the environment. And when we, you know, I'd come in, he does this little, I think it's um, nitroglycerin or something. He puts it up the little dots on any freckles that are looking scary to him, not to me. But anyway, he puts <laughs> the thing on and burns them off. And, um, and he said, I know, but he was so excited. And I said, what's, you know, what are you doing? What's your, what's your thing? He says, well, California has lost 94% of its kelp. And I said, oh, wow, I had no idea. But I do remember swimming in the ocean and there was tons of kelp. And now when I do go swimming in the ocean, I don't see it. And so it made sense when he was talking about it. And I lived on a boat. I sailed from California to Hawaii. So I like love, I love the ocean. Like it's my, it's part of my heart. All of nature is part of my heart. And so when he was talking about it, I kept asking him more and more about it. And so I invited him to be on my show. And what he's doing is he's, he's, 
in Mexico right now on the on the west coast of Mexico in Baja, he's planting kelp and his desire is to plant it out 200 miles to the international borders. And he's got like scaffolding where the kelp could grow, even though the the continental shelf drops off and it's very deep. So he's got the scaffolding and part of the reason he's doing this and he wants to do it all up California. And so that's that's where I'm coming in. But um, so part of the th reason he wants to do this is one kelp sequesters carbon and carbon is one of the biggest global warming potential things and so kelp sequesters carbon an acre per acre kelp sequesters more carbon than a rainforest we still need the rainforest but the kelp is doing such a great job and that's why he wants to go out 200 feet and why he wants to go all the way up the western coast and kelp also pulls in and basically I guess it sequesters, but it doesn't sequester it. It just like kelp eats up. I don't know what it does, but kelp eats up um, heavy metals. Mm -hmm. So he's going to, he, and it grows one to three, mi uh, one to three meters or uh, one to three feet per day. So that's like one foot to the, you know, three foot is like that, like, like that. That's a lot of growing, you know? Yeah. And so when he's talking about this he's so focused on the solution and he has i think he has like 27 companies where they're all doing something good for the environment so I've, i'm going to probably interview him 27 more times if he'll let me <laughs> um, but but so then he's going to he's going to harvest the kelp like just a couple feet of the kelp the kelp will keep growing he's going to chelate out the heavy metals and then sell the heavy metals to the companies that use them in a safe and healthy way and then He's going to use the kelp that he's chelated out the heavy metals as biofuel. Like this is a genius idea and it really takes care of so much. You know, it's helping the environment. It's helping cars. You can mix this biofuel like 50 50 with gasoline. Yeah. And so it'll be creating less pollution. It'll create more happiness in the ocean. The fish will be healthier to eat if you're going to eat fish, you know, because they're not going to have as many heavy metals if they're in that in that world. So, um, so I, I'm in the in the process of wanting to get it to more and more people who can actually get him able to do it in California. So that's really fun, and I feel like you know I just have a lot of really cool people in my life. So I want to see if I can connect people up to make things happen that I really believe in. Yes. And so that's something that's just happened naturally. I didn't mean when I started doing this show, the stories we love show, I didn't mean to become like a, a you know, spokesperson for people who are doing good environmental work. But since I was a kid, nature has always spoken to me. And so it makes sense that now I'm being guided in this way to be a benefit to people. I have another person who's doing a certain kind of solar in a way that can all be done on state lands. And it's just a really brilliant idea. So I'm, I'm doing things to like help both of them become more flowing in, in the bureaucracy of my California. Yes. <laughs> I love that example about the kelp and it, it reminds me of a, an additional resource I'll share with our listeners, just because the book happens to be on my desk. I'm getting ready to teach it. Paul Hawkins' two books, Drawdown and Regeneration, for anybody who's not currently plugged into the amazing array of solutions that are being implemented, like this kelp project, just get copies, or actually they're online as well, Paul Hawkins' Drawdown and Regeneration. You brought forward such a good example, and I'm continually trying to help people see, as you clearly do, there are literally countless healing, regenerative initiatives right now. And what people are getting, I want to come back to the frequency because it's so important, but what you raised is what people are getting is we're no longer looking for solutions that just help people or just help an ecosystem or an animal. We are in this extraordinary time where so many people recognize we are looking for the win, 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 win solution, I like to call it, you know, something that has 
so many benefits for people and the planet that maybe you can't even document them all. So that is really exciting. Let's talk more about the frequency because a lot of people understand this. A lot of people find it a little bit unfamiliar. Yeah. <laughs> How do you, maybe I'll, I'll try this question, but if you want to address something different about frequency, go ahead. The question I'll try is, how do you explain to somebody who's really in that problem mindset? The measurements of climate change look bad and poverty is terrible here and um, there are forest fires and it's hot and the water systems are showing signs of trouble. How do you help somebody kind of start looking in this higher frequency solutions direction? Well, now that I have this show and I'm learning so much, um, one of the reasons the climate is so warm is because of conventional farming. And so I only buy organic and I only, and I try to buy regenerative. One of the things I learned that I just love, um, and I don't know if Paul Hawkins talks about this because I haven't read his books, but I love that he's, I love the title of his book anyway. Um, so when we grow food with synthetic uh, pesticides and fertilizers, which are basically things that came from oil yeah. and they're being put into the ground. And we buy with, and we grow with GMO and we grow with pesticides and hormones and antibiotics. All of that kills the soil. Right. Soil is where we get our nutrients. So I want to make a shout out to anybody who either is a farmer of organic regenerative or eats organic regenerative, because when you start to recreate a healthy soil. This is now, this is me translating what I've watched other people talk about. So I'm hoping I'm accurate, yeah. but when you're recreating healthy soil, so it's got a microbiome, just like we have in our guts and in our skin, it's got um, all the minerals. A healthy soil is naturally full of all the minerals and the plants suck it up that, and the animals eat the plants. And so that's how we get our minerals and our vitamins and our probiotics. There's so much in the healthy soil. Yes. When you have healthy soil, the, the soil will first sequester water. So if there is a drought, there's less chance of farms being dried up. Um, so the soil sequesters water, so the water will be underground and it will go fuel the roots of all the plants. So that's one thing. Also, because there's more water sequestered, at least according to the film that I loved that I've seen many times now called The Biggest Little Farm, they didn't get, there was a huge fire in their area and they were doing regenerative organic farming and I buy their eggs that are $20 for a dozen and I don't care because I want to support them. Um, <laughs> they, um, when there was a big fire, the fire basically skipped over their, their farm. They didn't lose any topsoil like all their conventional farms that were around them. And they, their, their plants all lived and, and were nourished because as the rain had come before the fire, they were, they had a whole system underground that was nourishing the plants. So that topsoil that gets ruined when there's a rain or when there's, um, when it's, when you're using conventional farming, yes. um, the topsoil will get ruined and that's part of the problem that goes into the ocean because it's got pesticides, GMO, yeah. antibiotics, uh, hormones, all that stuff. So fish are, are looking weirder, you know, as they're eating more of these hormones. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but so what's great is that the more farms that grow organic, biodynamic, regenerative food that don't use GMO seeds, that don't use GMO um, plants, which are great seeds. Part of the reason that it's so hard is because when a farmer does do GMO and conventional farming, from what I understand, they're not allowed to use the seeds that the plants naturally make. They have to buy- And they're like, sterile. Those, those plants are genetically sterile. So even if you save the seeds, which from what I understand is illegal, they won't germinate there. Right. And when you're, doing, when you're doing organic biodynamic regenerative, the seeds are coming from the plants that you planted and the, the soil is getting regenerated. It's, it's, it's holding the carbon, sequestering the carbon 
carbon sequestering water and so the soil is getting healthier and healthier each time each year or each season that you're using it okay. and then the third thing that about this that's so exciting to me is that when you grow a biodiversity and you include natural grasses the natural grasses ameliorate methane so like that's so cool it, they really ameliorate a hundred times more methane than a ruminant like a cow can make and um at least this one guy i thought it was really funny he was he's from australia i want to interview him but he he's on a very tight schedule so probably won't get to but i love him his name is walter jane and he i've watched several of his videos and he said cows are the patsies and i i was thinking like what does he mean and he said because the oil companies that are fracking that's what's causing the methane release they're breaking through you know parts of the earth and methane that's under the earth coming up and so the frack and he said like in siberia it's bubbling methane is bubbling up and there's no cows you know they're doing the thing or there are but not as many so so that it's a trifecta if you're doing or if you do it well it's more than that it's a fourfecta can we say that word? Um, so the first one is you're going to sequester more water. You're going to sequester more carbon. You're going to ameliorate methane. Uh, if you're doing organic biodynamic, biodynamic and regenerative, you're going to make you're going to have seeds for free, and you're going to make the soil continually healthier. Plus, uh, let's say it's a five factor now. You and your uh, workers are going to be healthier because you're not touching things that have toxins on them that have been shown like they've been suing monsanto and winning because of uh the the roundup and other and glyphosate which is the same thing has glyphosate in it so um and they're winning you know so people are getting sick and so yeah. they're they're paying for it but it's still in the environment but um but if you start doing organic and if you switch and there's ways to do it one of the guys i interviewed i said well how you know if you want to talk to a guy you know or a, a person who's got a farm or a group who's got a farm and ask you know and teach them about how to go biodynamic regenerative organic what do you say to them if they're if they're doing conventional and he said it's going to take about three years but the first thing to do is to get to know your community. He said, most of these farms are shipping things out and they don't know their neighbors. They don't know who wants organic food. They don't know who needs it. So that's a way for them to start getting money and they can take one portion of their farm and do organic. And then as that starts to make money, do another portion of their farm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's gentle for them. And, and he's, and I said, what, what, what do they do if they get pests? And this is a guy who owns a regenerative organic farm. And he said, pests are usually a sign of soil imbalance. Yeah. And I thought, oh, that's so cool. You know, it's not about the pest. And he said, if you have a biodiversity, the plants that are around there are gonna cause the soil to be healthier. They're also gonna attract the bugs that eat the bugs that eat the plants, you know? Yeah. And so there's, and then the cows are gonna be healthier or the, or the pigs or whatever people are growing or, you know, raising they're going to be better because they're eating a biodiversity of food, just like humans need to eat more biodiversity. Yes. So part of what I'm saying, and I don't know if this answers your question is one, there are a lot of people who are doing things that are great Two, it can be done. It takes about three years from what I'm told to go from conventional to organic biodynamic regenerative. That's why it's good to do it in steps for the, for the finances but it's, it's so it's not that long when you think of life, right? And then also as a, as a consumer, I, I, I eat only organic unless you just can't find it. But usually if I can't find it organic, I don't eat it. I just give it up yeah. and um, I eat only organic. So I'm investing in these organic farms that are low. I eat as much local as I can. So I'm not contributing to the, the long truck holes and whatever else. Um, and I'm also, yeah, so I'm investing, like I said, $20 for that. I'll just tell you one story because it's funny and sorry if I'm going too long, but there was a guy at the, I was at the grocery store. My grocery store sells these, um, eggs from the, the apricot lane farms who, who is the star of the biggest little farm movie. It's a cute movie and it's great. It's a great movie. I recommend it. Yeah. I recommend it too. So 
I was getting their eggs and and like you have to get there at like when the store opens on only on Saturdays and then you have to have your you know you have to get to the egg section first because they can go in like that so I was um I was there and I asked and you have to ask because they they don't have them on the shelf it's just too much like they only get like eight maybe eight dozen or something so they um so I said to the guy who worked there hey, can you see if you have any of these apricot laying farms eggs for me? And he said, yeah, I'll be right back. So when he came back, there was another gentleman who was looking in the case and he could he was very close to where I was. The guy said, um, you know, these are $20. I said, yeah, I know. I, I really want, I love them. They're, they're amazing. They're different. They're different eggs than you normally eat. Like they're so good. And um, the guy who was next to me turned to me and he goes, if my mama saw me buying a dozen eggs for $20, she'd whoop my ass. And I said, I said, well, I said, the reason I'm buying them is one, because I want to support these farmers that are doing something good for the earth. The reason I'm buying them is because they taste incredible. The reason I'm buying them is because they have nourishment, whereas the food that the eggs that are not raised organic and biodynamic and regenerative don't have as much nourishment or they don't have any. And I said, I'm also buying it because I want to be healthy. A lot of people don't eat organic food and then they get toxic diseases, diseases from toxins. And I just want to live a ha happy, healthy, good life. You know, they found like so many diseases, it's even dementia and all these Alzheimer's, those kind of diseases and other diseases, cancers, a lot of them come from toxicity. So I'm really that. And he looks at me and he goes, and the other guy was still standing there, the worker. And um, and the guy goes, all right, give me a dozen. <laughs> <laughs> so <tell> him. <laughs> you persuaded him. That is a really good story. I love that you talked about organic, biodynamic, regenerative agriculture. It's a huge interest of mine. I actually teach a class on it and I'm, I'm getting ready for, for the, the next iteration of that class. And it's a beautiful example of one of the areas where we are innovating right now to not only benefit ourselves, but the earth. And I'll note for our listeners that the Rodale Institute is one of the organizations that publishes free white papers showing the calculations on how quickly we could turn around climate change with regenerative agriculture. Because regenerative agriculture, as you were saying, Karen, it handles the soil in a way that allows the soil to do what it is supposed to do, which is suck carbon out of the atmosphere. So if you, if anybody wants to follow up on that more, go to the Rodale Institute and look for their papers. And happily, there are a lot of scientists in the world who've been working on this for the last couple of decades, such as Dr. Ratan Lal. I can't remember if he's at Iowa State or Ohio State, but I say that to to indicate we're at a really exciting time when people like Karen and I, who are not agricultural professionals, are finally starting to hear about these decades of research that are, are finally coming to the public. And you know, when you talk about those beautiful eggs from Apricot Lane Farm, and people should definitely see the Biggest Little Farm film because it's gorgeous and it explains a lot of this visually, there's a, there's a frequency there is what I heard in your story, right? You know that these eggs feel good. You feel good supporting this farm. And, you know, not everybody can spend $20 on a dozen eggs, but that's an example. That's just an example of ways that we can be in the solution rather than moaning to people about all the statistics we have about, for example, the damage that conventional agriculture is doing to people and planet, we can be in the solution. Yeah, and I will say, I don't eat that many eggs. <laughs> right, so, so yeah, need, totally. For I one person, I bet it doesn't eggs last week. you for a while. Yeah, 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 yeah so. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we all, I, everybody has to look for where they can afford the time and the money to contribute to solutions. And there are many, many, many ways. So maybe we could talk about discipline, which is something that you are an expert in, I would say. And your book, Chronic Pleasure, 
really details your discipline journey from being very, very sick to finding a whole set of mindset and inner transformation practices that that led you to this gorgeous level of wellness and beauty and contribution. But, you know, I would say, and I think you agree, there's a big pivot going on in human society now. A lot of us in many cultures around the world, probably most cultures, were raised with discipline. You got to work hard. You got to be strict with yourself. You have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It's going to be hard. You have to work really hard and and just hope you're going to make it. And even when you make it, it's still going to be hard, right? There's this whole human mythology around discipline. Yeah. And I just use the word mythology because it is a huge myth. And it's a myth that can cause people to get sick, to get stressed out, to not be able to function or to not want to do things. Totally. And it is not a path of joy. So, and you know, we don't need to take the time to do it, but I can think of so many cultures around the world that that are are very adherent to discipline. It's not just one culture, it's many, many cultures. Right. I think, and I suspect you agree, there's a transition going on in humanity where people are either learning or remembering discipline. Tell us about discipline. <laughs> what is it? How would somebody dip a toe in? Yeah, I, so this is a word I created just because I also know a lot of kids get disciplined in a way that doesn't feel good, you know, spanked or hit or something like that. I'm going to discipline you, right? So there's a lot of trauma that can happen with that word discipline. So when I was thinking about things I wanted to do, you know, I've written three books. I love to work out. I love to eat healthy. You know, I love to cook. All those things happened because of using discipline. Discipline. So discipline to me is when you think of something you want to do, and you might have to do this a while before you see yourself doing it. So um, I look at any subject. So I didn't know how to cook. I was always burning things. I had narcolepsy. So I would, you know, I'd start to make something, put it in the oven, and then I'd fall asleep, and then the smoke would be going, and the dog would be barking, and my husband at the time would be yelling. So it wasn't, it's not a good plan to do that. So I, um, I didn't know how to cook because I just didn't, I never really learned it. So I just started to say to myself while I was sick, while I was barely able to function, I'd be lying in bed and I just think, oh, I really love to cook. I love cooking healthy food. I love cooking organic food. I love food being really tasty. I love eating the food I cook. I love cooking food that makes me and the other people that I cook for healthier. I love eating food that's good for my brain. I love cooking food that's good for my brain. I love cooking food that's good for every cell of my body. I love being healthy. I love feeling good. I love cooking food. I'm a really good cook, right? Now, I wasn't cooking at the time. It took me a couple months before I started to learn. I, I What I did was I got an organic food ingredient delivery service. I think it was Sun Basket. And I got all these, they they send you the ingredients and then they send you like, how do you cook it? And I learned so much. And by the time I'd been doing that for like a year or year and a half, it's also very cost effective if you if you use, use it, I think anyway. Well, anyway, I, I used it. And then after about a year and a half, all of a sudden I knew how to cook. And I was cooking intuitively. I don't really look at, I sometimes look at recipes, but I normally change them if I do. And I, now I just know how to cook. And when people come over, most of the time, I mean, it's been consistent. Even when chefs come over to eat, they're like, you're a really good cook. This is phenomenal. And then other people are like, you're a really good cook. And, and, and I do have a a friend who's a chef who has not eaten my food yet, but he does also give me guidance. Chef Joshua. You you better have him try it. Okay. Here's what I want to mark for people in what you said. And tell me if if you want to phrase it differently. You practiced the frequency and the desires in your mind and then you found a way to put them into action would you say that's right where you like you oriented yourself to i want to be able to prepare healthy food and enjoy it you focused on that for a while got into that mindset or frequency and then you put that into action i don't say i want because that creates want 
So I say, I love cooking healthy food, for example. When I would say all those things that I said a minute ago, I said it while I was in bed when I couldn't cook. And then I didn't look for something to learn how to cook. If somebody told me about it. I looked at it, made sense. And then when I was doing it, I was cooking really good food because they had the recipes and they had the ingredients, right? And my food, I was like, wow, this is really good. And then, and it was organic and it was, so it went along with my values. And then after a time, I just didn't need to do it. And I just started to cook a lot of the same things I learned just by doing it. And it wasn't that I'm, I find a way to do it. It's that I, I can't not do it because the discipline creates a momentum. Mm -hmm. So like a lot of people who don't like to work out, for example, you know, if you start saying, I love to work out, I love to be healthy, I love to be fit, I love to be slender, I love to feel good in my body, I love to be strong, I love to be flexible, I love to be capable, I love to be able to lift heavy things in a safe way, I love to be, um, you know, I love to feel my blood, blood moving through my body, I love to get good circulation, I love to circulate my lymph, I love to benefit my brain with working out, I love to raise my HGH, which you can do when you work out in certain ways. I love to, you know, look good in my body. I love to have clothes fit me really well, right? So you just start to create this thing. You could be li literally lying on your couch and at some point you're going to go, God, I got to go work out. I can't wait. It's going to be so fun. And, you know, working out is really fun. It feels really good to be strong. It feels so good. You know, so you just start to practice it. And then the, the momentum, I call it like a magic carpet ride of love the magic carpet ride of love will literally take you so that you're you're compelled to do the thing. If you practice it enough, you don't have to do it until you feel compelled. When you feel compelled, it it's it's effortless. And that goes back to discipline. It's a bliss to do it because you've practiced this new kind of awareness of what you want as if you already have it. Now, as you move into the next thing, as you're compelled to do the next thing, there's no effort to it. I did it about my books before I ever wrote a book. You know, I love to write. I'm a really good writer. I take dictation from my spirit. I'm just listening when I'm right. I'm channeling. I'm just allowing it to flow. It's really fun. People love to read what I write. You know, so I've just said that. And then and then I started to write books and I've written three books and I'll probably write a, many more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that explanation. It's beautiful. And it it makes me want to ask you to talk through another version of it with the topic of, because I, I really want people to get to hear your version of this. Talk us through the topic of what somebody is experiencing if they feel that they want to contribute to healing regenerative solutions in the world maybe focused primarily on people, maybe on the natural world, maybe on both, maybe it's in their neighborhood, their workplace, their town, the whole world, doesn't matter. I, to me, this feels so important right now because I feel a lot of people are kind of getting this inkling. I want to help. There are solutions. I want to contribute to solutions. But then a lot of people get held back by self-doubt, doubt about the practicality, the income, whether their ideas will be received or whatever. So talk us through your version of what can someone do if they're feeling this call to contribute to healing solutions, but they're kind of stuck and they don't know if they even believe in it. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So that's something that I didn't know what I could do because I, I, like I said, I love, I love our planet. And just so you know, the word ecology Echo means home. It's a study of our home, the words of our home. So, um, so how I do it, because I didn't know I'd be doing this, this show, the Stories We Love show, where I'm interviewing people that are being a benefit to the world. I didn't know I'd be interviewing them. And I didn't know that I would be interviewing so many people that are doing regenerative farming or some kind of thing like that. So how it happens for me is I think I love this planet. I love this planet. I love this planet so much. I love nature. I love nature. I want to support nature in any way I can. I go out every morning and I say to my plants, thank you so much. I love you I, all, to the whole canyon. I live in a canyon, so there's all these trees and everything. Thank you, you guys. Thank you for taking up my carbon dioxide. Thank you for giving me oxygen. Thank you for showing me how beautiful you are. Thank you how 
for showing me how abundant you are. Thank you. I'm just looking out there. Thank you for how much, you know, beauty you give me. Thank you for all the playful squirrels and geckos and hawks and falcons that we have here and the deer and the skunk and they're so cute and I love them. Thank you for making it so beautiful. I love the ocean. I love the ocean so much. I love being on the ocean. I love being in the ocean. I love the sea creatures. I love seeing the sea creatures so happy. I love seeing them healthy. I love seeing them do really well. I love seeing the coral reefs thriving in the same biodiversity that they came to this planet with or that they were created in this planet with. So the same biodiversity. Some people are doing coral where they're just doing the top ones that that work instead of mimicking you. I love, I love biomimicry. I love mimicking what nature does because nature knows the, the path. Nature is so brilliant. I love seeing how nature does so many good things. I love being outside. I love being in the sun. I love being on the earth. I love being at the beach. I love being in the ocean. You know, so I like to start to say all that stuff. And at a certain point, as you're saying it, you know, somebody shows up in your life or something shows up and you go, oh, I can do that. You could show up. There could be just like a, uh, like one guy I know, John Quigley. He's a guy who, I think he's one of the people who started Earth Day back when I was little and I love him. And I've met him a couple of times. And one of the things he does is he does, he's an artist. So he does art installations, like in someplace special with children forming things like a peace sign or forming something like a heart. And so the, the kids are there and they're all, you know, they're all dressed maybe in some color or maybe m many colors, or whatever, but they form a giant, you know, it's like thousands of kids, giant heart or a giant peace sign. And they're in nature and they're working on something that as a kid, they're gonna go, oh, it's important to be peaceful. It's important to care. So he's an artist doing that, right? And then there's other people, you know, just like the guy who, one of the guys who did the regenerative farm that I've interviewed, he, um, he's a surfer. So he's a surfer and he's looking at the ocean going, oh my God, the biggest problem in the ocean is from farming, conventional farming. And he became a, a, a regenerative organic biodynamic farmer. Like that's so, he didn't mean to, he just was like, I want to help this world. And he helps his community and he helps, you know, people that can't afford to eat organic, they give them boxes of food to, to take home each week. You know, that's really sweet. And he and his, pays his workers, you know, a, a healthy wage and gives them uh, health insurance, right? So he's like thinking on all these different levels, but it happens because he loves the ocean. He loves riding the waves and he loves the ocean being clean like it was when he was probably younger or at least it was cleaner. Um, so that's kind of how you do it. But then the other thing is you can say things, I love being a contribution. I love being a benefit. You don't have to have money to be a contribution. If you're happy, you're a benefit. You're sending your, your happy waves throughout the world on what I call the inner net. You know, we're all connected. We're all one. We're just all God and drag, if you will, you know, all different forms of God or that I'm not religious, but source energy, infinite intelligence, nature, whatever you're calling it, we're all, we're all that masquerading as, you know, whoever we are, right? So it's just like this, there's so much. And if you start to say, I love being a contribution, I love being a benefit, I love being a gift. I love benefiting people that are doing good in the world. I love doing things that help the world. So there's so many things you could do. You could just go, you know, sign petitions. There's so many petitions out there on, you know, climate and you could sign petitions. One of the things I don't do anymore, I used to go on um, cruises and then I learned that cruise ships are one of the bigger causes of stuff in the ocean. So now I'm like signing every petition about please have the cruise ships stop throwing out the waste into the ocean and please have the cruise ships pay the fines that they were told to pay that they haven't paid. You know, so I'm like, you know, that's really important, you know, and so um, so I'm just like, I'm just doing that right now, but who knows, maybe I'll get a chance to meet somebody who can actually affect the cruises. It's something that I do, you know, I just end up meeting people. Like you just, if you're thinking, if you're happy and you're out in the world a little bit and you're thinking of things that you would like to do, just the nature of it, it doesn't have to be 
Like you don't have to be specific of like, I want to do solar. You could just be, I like green energy. I love feeling like the, the energy is coming from nature, you know, and you just start to activate it. You'll be in the right place. If you're feeling good, you'll be in the right place at the right time with the right people in the right way. It'll become more and more intuitive. That's what I teach my clients is how to, you get into that place where you're in a really high frequency or really happy, that's another way to say it, or in love with everybody, which is where I live, then the next steps you take are more intuitive. They're more right for you. You're more in the right place at the right time with the right people in the right way. So that, so you don't have to ever lose hope um, if, if you don't want to, because there's so many people doing so many good things and, and you can contribute first by being happy um, and I'll give you the, the link for my books for free so you can have them. But first by being happy and then also by just affirming, you know, I love being a contribution. I love being a benefit. You yourself are a gift. You yourself, if you're listening, even if you're not listening, but anybody who's listening, I want you to hear that you yourself are a gift. You're a contribution. You're a benefit already. And so anytime you lighten somebody's life up, a little bit or you smile or you say thank you or you you know buy organic food you're already doing lots of things that are being a benefit to the world anytime you can listen to somebody with a different opinion of yours and not name call and just listen and just be able to have a, a fun conversation with them and get to understand them and them understand you you know that's a benefit that's causing peace one of the things that i remember from when i was a child was uh, uh, somebody had a card that they gave me which said um world peace begins in your own heart and if you're peaceful you're not going to go shooting anybody up if you're peaceful you're probably not going to go join a war if you're peaceful you're probably not going to start yelling at people because they have a different opinion of you than you you'll just be at peace right and so that's part of but I love teaching because when people get that, when people get how to be in a, how to get their subconscious aligned with what they want, you know, they're more relaxed, they're having more fun with people, they're more fun if they're calling customer service, customer service treats them better, people start gifting them things, money starts coming to them, their health starts to improve, all of this stuff shifts when people let go of their subconscious blocks and put in the kind of programming that they want because most of our subconscious was programmed by other people you know parents siblings school doctors religions all those things they program media it all programs us so what i love to do is like help people let go of that programming and get the programming they actually want <laughs> you know the programming that lights them up the programming that makes them feel amazing and healthy and having great relationships and having more money and all of that stuff. That's what I like to do. It's so fun. I think that's really brilliant. And it, it circles back to what you were talking about earlier about, are we being, you know, informed, fed or programmed by the bad news? Or are we stepping into the other programs that also exist here, right? I mean, I know for a fact, and so do you, there are more good news stories every day than bad news stories. And it's a matter of which program, which stream, which frequency we're choosing to be in. Here's a question I'd love for you to address though, because I, I think this is an obstacle for people. I hear people say that although they're, they're very attracted, to what you're talking about, they're worried that if they keep their focus on what they desire to experience, what feels good, the joy, the discipline, they won't be being realistic or they won't achieve things. Like, you know, people kind of misperceive this as a lack of realism or inadequate action. What do you say when you hear those concerns? Those are valid concerns. Um, I'll give an example of how it worked in my life. There was a, um, 
when I lived in Santa Monica, there was a poster of somebody and it said wanted, and it was a man. And I didn't really look at it because I wanted to be happy, but it was something about, you know, women and not and sexual assault. And there were people on the corner in a news, like a news group that were doing some interview on the corner. So I was already in a state of, of love. So I thought this guy, if I even meet him one, he won't recognize me as a victim anymore. Cause I, sh I used to be a victim, but I'm not anymore. I take total responsibility for my life. And I feel so good because of that Two, um, if he sees me, he he'll either, you know, see the love that I am and he'll just relax and not do anything, or he won't be able to see me because you can't see somebody like a lot of, a lot of people who are on the path of doing something un, unkind, they can't see people. They don't, they don't, re I'm at a totally different place. And the other one was, um, or he, he'd see me and he'd realize I was a love and he'd say, you know what, I've been doing something off and I need to, I need to shift. So that's what I thought. Then I go to Oregon with one of my girlfriends and um, we're driving around and we stop at this on this block and we figure we're going to look for a dinner place. I had told her that story. We went to a great restaurant. It was so good. So I bought food for the next day because uh, we were staying on a farm that had no food. It was really interesting. But um, <laughs> so I had all these like three boxes. I'm wearing a dress. I had on, you know, kind of cute shoes that were a little high. And um, and we're walking back from the restaurant to the car, which was around the block. And I'm holding these three boxes. And I say, hey, I'm so sorry, but I just feel compelled to skip. And she says, go right ahead. You know, and so I skip all the way from where we were to around around the block, and I'm waiting at the car another five minutes before she comes. She's a slow walker, um, <laughs> and she comes up and she goes, "Did you see the flasher?" And I said, "What flasher?" She said, "Oh, 15, 15 feet um, after you started skipping, there was a guy with his pants off, and he was masturbating at the on the side of the thing." And I said, "No, I I totally missed it." And she said. Do you see how that's exactly like the story you told about the guy on the box? And I said, yep. And so it was so interesting. You know, I, I just didn't see it because I wasn't focused on, oh my God, what if there's, you know, somebody bad in the world? I was just focused on being happy. And so even though it wasn't the same guy, it was evidence that corroborated, that corroborated the same guy. Another experience just to say how this works is I was filming, I'm an actor. I was filming in Hollywood in a part of the Hollywood that's known to be a lot of gangs and, and not the best place to, to like have your car and your life. And so, so we were doing this and we were parked on the street. So I did this um, acting and it was about three or four hours. And when I got out, I looked in my, my purse and I didn't have my phone. I was like, oh, I must have left it in the car. But when I got to the car, it wasn't in the car. And what I realized, I looked out the front of the window and I was like, well, I guess I got to get a new phone. And I look at the front of the window, somebody in that neighborhood, that's not the best neighborhood, but it obviously was the best neighborhood. My phone must have been in my pocket or my, my lap when I was in the car and it must have fallen onto the ground, onto the street. So when I parked, the phone was on the ground and I didn't see it. Somebody had taken my phone, wrapped my headphones around it, and put it under my windshield wiper so that nobody else would really see it and i would see it i just started crying i was like you guys i was just like yelling nobody's out you know there's nobody else <laughs> that i could see but i was like thank you whoever did this thank you that's so sweet i love you thank you so much that's so thoughtful i love you thank you and i was like crying all the way home because that's a, you know, it's an expensive phone. It's an iPhone. And it's, it's quite possible that that could have been something that they could have benefited from, but they chose to have integrity and honesty and to help me. They didn't know me. So, so when people say, I want to focus on reality, there's all these different layers of reality. Which reality? <laughs> Yeah, there's that is reality. And there's reality, there's so much reality that is good. And when you or a good feeling or is about people doing good, 
when you focus on those things, you'll see more of it, you know, even so we have a part of our brain called the reticular activating system. And the, that's the part of the brain that let's say you buy a red car, all of a sudden you see all the red cars around you, right? It's the thing of your brain that recognizes the things that are consistent. If you've been focusing on things that don't feel good for a while, that's still what you're going to see. And it's the same algorithm as you know, Google or other search engines are using, they're basically mimicking the way the reticular activating system works, Facebook, Google, all those places. So they're giving you things that are right in your line of focus, what you've been searching for before, all that stuff. So, so if you start to, like, I want to say manually, or just start to disciplinely focus on things that feel good. I love focusing on things that feel good. I love seeing all the good news. I love being a benefit. I love helping people. I love being kind. I love being easy. I love being relaxed. I love life being easy and fun. And you start to do that. What you do is you're changing the reticular activating system, that part of your brain that will only see the red car. And you're changing it to be able to see what you are focusing upon. So in this case, it would be on news of well-being. You can do the same thing with search engines where you type in the the you know good news stories you could go to mine stories we love um good news stories you type it in and you're going to start to get things that show up and the more you do it your brain is going to start to show you things that are good news and the algorithms for these internet places are going to show you more things to look at that are good news so um so it's all out there. You have every range. You have every range of anything that's out there. The news tends to focus on that which doesn't feel good. And then they repeat it over and over and over and over and over. And they'll repeat the same story and it has no no validity, no, no good feeling attached to it over and over and over and over. So And it's programming us, as you yeah, said earlier. Really because the what the 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 subconscious works in a couple ways lots of ways the subconscious works baby squirrel the subconscious works by repetition just like you know you've heard things like you can almost everybody in america can say I'm the pledge of allegiance to the flag and they can say that thing i don't know if i can but most people can say that because you got programmed with it growing up and you might have prayers that you learned as a child or you might have somebody yelling at you as a child you know clean up your room or you're no good or you're stupid or you can't focus or things that aren't so so helpful and you might have that and when you are aware you might also see you know i'm really brilliant at basketball or i'm really brilliant at writing or i'm really brilliant at something else or um, I can remember. So the subconscious programs by repetition. It also programs when you're in a really relaxed state, like um, in the theta, um, the, the theta range. And so the more relaxed you are, you're programming. And a lot of people fall asleep when they're watching the news, which means that they're getting programmed because they're going through that theta level. They're going from beta to alpha to theta to delta. And while they're in that theta level where you're kind of awake, but you're kind of not, your brain is absorbing that um, and putting it into your subconscious. So I don't have a TV. And the reason I don't have a TV is because I realized long ago, like when I was in high school, that I don't want to be programmed by somebody else. I, I can still watch movies and still, you know, stream things, but I, I choose not to be programmed by other people. Well, I love that you phrase it that way because... I think a really nice, very simple way to encapsulate your body of work so far is you've learned to program yourself and to program yourself for joy and bliss, discipline and contribution, and you teach other people to do that. It has been my great pleasure to talk with you today, Karen. I so much appreciate your work and I really encourage listeners who are curious about anything Karen said today, read Chronic Pleasure, which is really a guidebook to this work. Effortless Enchantment is more of Karen's personal story about the pleasures and traumas that led her to a place of, of needing to practice chronic pleasure. 
Is there anything else that you want to share with us or offer in this conversation, Karen, or do you, do you feel complete with what you've shared? I just want to share one more thing because some people don't believe that we're all connected, but they've done uh, entanglement studies. And now it's really obvious they've done entanglement studies in physics where you can have one photon and then another photon that are miles and miles and miles away. One photon spins and the other photon spins exactly. You know, they're just, they're connected. And also science, quantum physics, that part of science recognizes that everything is about our perception. We only see through our perception. So you can literally change your perception and change the way you see the world. And the more you do that, the better your health will be, the more money comes to you, the more fun you have, the better your relationships will be. It's a really, uh, it's a really good path. And so there's science to corroborate what I'm saying. I know what I talk about can pre- be perceived as airy-fairy, but I'm a, I'm a bit of a nerdy girl. I studied mind-body science. I have an interest in neuroscience. The other thing that's interesting is that our brains have neuroplasticity, which means that the, the neurons can make new connections, and neurogenesis, which means new neurons can be born. And if you know that, because I was taught as a child, you know, you can't grow new brain cells. And I just remember thinking, that makes no sense. That makes no sense. It makes no sense not to eat fat, you know, like when they said fat is bad for you. I was like, that doesn't make any sense. And it's true, you should eat healthy fat, not not the fat of you should eat healthy fat like whatever uh, ghee and olive oil and avocados and stuff like that and and um lots of healthy fat helps your brain and uh you know alter your perception if you want you know because when you do alter it you'll get so much goodness yes thank you for mentioning that and i know you have a recent interview on your podcast with your friend dr bruce lipton who's been a major voice on these topics. And I think I just wanna echo what you said because it's so important. It encapsulates everything we've talked about today and all of my interest in bringing you on the podcast. What you essentially said just now is change how you see the world and then you will change how you experience the world. And Along with you, I invite people to test it out. It's, it's a safe experiment, right? <laughs> um, people can test it out and see what they think. And it is really a pathway to personal well-being and thriving and sharing your thriving with others in the world through your contributions. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Shara. It's just wonderful to be here. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you, Karen. Such a delight to talk with you. Thank you for listening to Humans and Earth. Please share this episode to broaden engagement in the regeneration our world needs. You'll find social media links in the show notes. To explore our other offerings, visit www.humansandearth.com.